This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today, are Christians giving Jesus a bad name? One man says yes, and he's a pastor. He's going to explain why. Then, the movie Unplanned explored the real-life story of a woman who ran a Planned Parenthood clinic who later changed her mind on abortion and began fighting the pro-choice movement. One of the stars from that movie, Robina Scott, joins me today and shares her story of how the movie is changing lives. But first, with social media, no one can be neutral about any topic. From racism to trade in China, our nation has become instantly offended when we hear someone with a different opinion other than ours. To get some insight on how the Bible looks at this, I spoke with Bishop Kyle Searcy from his church in Montgomery, Alabama. Hey, something we see uh, in the news a lot, it's all over social media, and it's the, uh, the quick labeling of, of people who dis you disagree with as being hateful or spiteful, or if, if I don't agree with you, then, then what you're saying is hate language. Is that just for today, or you see that growing uh, across the nation? Unfortunately, I do believe it's growing, Bob. Um, social media is a wonderful platform. It gives us the ability to know what's going on in the world. It's increased globalism. It's increased our ability to really be connected. But there are some aspects of it that are somewhat different. I often think about growing up in my neighborhood when somebody uh, would say something about you, there was enough proximity for you to go to them and say, well, say that to my face. I don't know if you remember that. Say that right to my there, face. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, social media gives you the ability to say whatever you want to say in the privacy of your home or on your cell phone. Uh, and you don't have to face the individual with the exception of possibly being unfriended. Yes, that will really ruin my world. So it's given us the ability to be vocal and it's given us the ability to take on other people's offenses that may not even be our issue. You know, somebody in uh, Shukamu, Mississippi, or, you know, somewhere across the world can experience something that all of a sudden we begin to take on angst and anger based on something that happened to someone else that we don't even know, never met. So it creates a, a great deal of mob psychology. And I believe all of that together is beginning to build and create a climate where people are beginning to put these easy labels on things and uh, the issues are more complex than the easy labels. And one of those labels is uh, that aspect of hate. Do you think that uh, the, the taking up of, of somebody else's offense, uh, you, you, you grab hold of that offense, it's not yours, you see some injustice, maybe a, a, a true injustice, and you take it up, you think that's kind of assuaging my own guilt, I'll take up their offense and I can be, I can, I can be angry about that, but it sets aside my own guilt for maybe doing that same thing to somebody at some other time in my life. Well, it can be. Yeah, it certainly can be. You know, uh, the scripture says, physician, heal thyself. Uh, Jesus, when a woman was caught in the act of adultery, said, he does without sin cast the first stone. And I think that oftentimes we don't look inward. Uh, instead, we look outward. And it really is easy for us to, and it goes both ways. We can see somebody mistreated and it could bring up the pain of our own mistreatment and injustice. And at the same time, we could actually take somebody's burden. And it could cover up our uh, our guilt in doing that to someone else. In, in today's society, uh, when we look at what's going on right now, is some of that legitimate? I mean, we see a, we've seen a lot of injustice. We've seen a lot of racial hatred. We've seen a lot of, 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 of just hatred between regions and different kinds of social injustice. Is some of it legitimate and then it grows from that? You know, I, <laughs> I'm going to crack a little joke here. Uh, I, I, don't know that that's, I don't know that that's a legitimate question. No, I, I don't really mean that. That's really a joke. Uh, the, 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 the way I mean that is I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. How much of the world do we spend time trying to change and how much of the world do we learn to ride with and point it in a, in a better direction? And it, it, it just kind of is, you know, uh, again, social media gives us the ability for a lot more of what people are thinking and feeling to begin to be manifest, but a microscope is not wrong. Um, read a story years ago about a guy who looked at something in a microscope and didn't like what he saw, so he picked up the microscope and threw it across the room and broke it. Well, that didn't change anything. So what, what social media is doing is amplifying what is, and, and since it is, what needs to happen? And I think what needs to happen is, is the, uh, again, uh, I'm quite prejudiced in this, but I'm blatantly prejudiced in this, and I'll admit my prejudice in this. The gospel is the answer to the world's problems. Jesus, his teaching, his love, 
And what he recommends is the answer to the world's problems. As we see this, I think instead of getting deeply involved in the political debates and the ideology of it and trying to reform certain aspects of society, our number one goal should be to get the gospel into the hearts of people, get society looking more like a true biblical society, and that, in a sense, will begin to shift, whether it's the, the hate culture or social media, whatever may be going on, we have to go back to the foundational answer of that question. Everybody will not embrace the gospel, but history proves out societies that have a Judeo-Christian ethic, mindset, morality tend to fare better in every area of society. People who decide to honor the Ten Commandments and live by the Ten Commandments, those societies are a lot better in every respect and every aspect. So I think we have a responsibility to light the light, not take a light and put it under a bushel, not get uh, absorbed into darkness, but to actually light a light, be that city on a hill, and begin to manifest the nature and the culture that Jesus brought us in this earth. Is it easier for me as I'm sitting in the pew, though, to get all excited and upset and, and challenge somebody who's a thousand miles away for their, for their injustice than it is for me to walk out the door and, and try to make true justice happen in my neighborhood? Now, you spoke a mouthful there, Bob. Absolutely. Uh, it is a lot easier, and we, we need to understand that expressing your opinion is not the same as, uh, as the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. You know, going, therefore, to reach, teach all nations is not the same as expressing your opinion on social media. So, yeah, it is easy, and it is easy for pe people to think they made some contribution because they were empathetic towards somebody experiencing injustice or, or, or had a, uh, here's what happens a lot these days, uh, a conversation. Uh, we we want to have a conversation about what's going on. Well, conversations may expose people to a few different uh, ways of thinking about things, but conversations don't generally change the world. Action changes the world. And again, I can't think of any better action than us being who Jesus called us to be, and that's agents of light. The movie Unplanned, it caused an uproar as the film produced by Christians depicted the true story of an abortion clinic manager who changed her view on abortion after witnessing an actual abortion for the first time. Well, one of the movie's stars is Robina Scott, and her journey from Hollywood to leading a ministry and then back to the silver screen is what I wanted to find out more about as she joins me via Skype from Los Angeles. Been an actress, and you thought you were leaving that part behind. God had called you to something else, and then God calls you back to that. You were actually on, on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It was during my time on Buffy the Vampire Slayer many years ago. Not that uh, many. It was a lot of years. <laughs> uh, it was during that time that I became a Christian. And I stayed in entertainment for a short time, but I really felt a, a conflict as I was yeah. you know, going on auditions with the material. And then I also very quickly just had an affinity for the things of God. And I felt the Lord was telling me to, to walk away from my 20 year career in entertainment and launch into full-time ministry. So that's what I did. I mean, you're doing auditions, you've been in Buffy, you, you dance with Prince. That's I mean, correct. all this great career in Hollywood, what are you walking away to? I mean, how do, you, how do you trust God enough to say, I'm going to leave this and go into some place I know yeah, not what it is? It's part of how God fashioned me. I'm a risk taker. And, uh, you know, some people are, are, they need all their ducks in a row before they move. Yeah. That's, that's not who I am. I'm a jumper. Uh, so when the Lord says move, I move. And I, I literally walked away from my career and stepped into full-time ministry when I didn't have a ministry. And it was an intense transition. I mean, I didn't have any vehicle for finances. So uh, it was a tough time, but I really had to learn dependence on God. And that's where my relationship with him really became just cemented because I had to literally walk by faith. And I just pressed into him very deeply. And then over, uh, you know, a little bit of time, I started to get invites to speak at churches. And um, then the ministry started to to blossom. But you knew when you walked away, you were walking into a ministry. I did. Somehow God was calling you to ministry, but you had never been in ministry before, had you? I've never been in ministry, but I started at my church teaching Bible okay. study. And it just, it, I just knew it was, it was where God was leading me. I was praying for people and uh, the prayer that would come through was just quite powerful. It was beyond my, my time in the Lord. It mm -hmm. just was a little more mature. Uh, and it just, it grew very quickly. Okay, at that point then, you're in ministry. How long had you been in ministry between leaving that career and what's happened in the last year? About 15 years. Wow. Uh, 
been traveling, speaking. I planted a church, as you mentioned, with my husband. So we did that for a few years. Uh, I speak all across the country and internationally. I wrote my book, traveled with that. I really had no intention of ever going back to Hollywood. But interestingly, people would start to, uh, you know, I'd be on a talk show and people would say, you know, I'm just sensing God's not done with you in Hollywood. Or I'd be at a church and someone would pray over me and they would say, I'm, I'm really sensing in my spirit Hollywood. So I said, well, you know, God would have to do it. it. He'd really have to drop it in my lap because I'm not going to pursue it. There's not much there that I'd be interested in doing because I'm not going to do anything that conflicts with um, what I believe. So I said, well, if God opens a door and he wants me to do it, we'll see what happens. And that is what happened. I mean, through just a God only series of events, I met a woman, never knew her, just met someone who happened to know Carrie Solomon and Chuck Konzelman, who wrote the hit film God's Not Dead a few years mm -hmm. ago. They were working on their new project, Unplanned, and this lady just sensed that she's a Christian woman. She said, I feel like I'm supposed to introduce you to these guys. So I went and had a coffee with them, and they told me about the project. I was intrigued. Uh, yeah. They shared with me a little bit about my character, the head of Planned Parenthood. I was a little wary yeah, about that, especially when I read some of the material. Yeah. I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know if I can say these things. That's the evil but stepmother, I, yeah. Yeah, she's Cruella DeVille. That's mm -hmm. what people call her, Cruella DeVille. But little do they know I'm the Christian Cruella. I'm, you know, I'm a minister. People are shocked when they see the movie and they find out I'm a minister. But uh, yeah, I went in and auditioned for the movie, my first audition in 15 years, and uh, they offered me the role. Did that, did that feel a little strange getting back into it? You think, God, what are you doing now? Did it feel a little strange going back in front of the cameras and, and the yeah. audition and the whole the whole thing that goes with that? I felt rusty, but thank God the anointing can can. Uh, cover over some other things that need covering. And then my first scenes back were, my very first day on set were my most intense scenes. Mm -hmm. When, you know, talking about, uh, you know, abortion is basically our bread and butter. This is what we do. This is what we're about. So I just jumped in full force. Yeah, how do you get into that character when it's so foreign to who you really are? I mean, I, I know actors and actors can do that, but how do you just jump right back into it when you're role playing? Well, I, I just sensed when I read the script that I knew who this character needed to be. Mm -hmm. And I, I tapped into that same passion and drive I have for women doing women's ministry, you know, that kind of, that kind of passion. Um, but I turned down the compassion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I played her as very driven, very passionate about the cause, but with uh, pretty much no compassion. Yeah, there, there are people out there who, I mean, Plan Unplanned has been all over the media, social media, and, and the, the controversy about the ratings and things like that. But there are people out there who don't really know what the movie is. They haven't seen it yet. Give us a, a synopsis of that. Unplanned is a true story based on the book Unplanned, written by Abby Johnson. Mm -hmm. Abby Johnson was a young gal on her college campus, recruited by Planned Parenthood the day where they have all the booths up and they're getting you know college kids to check out different careers. So she came from a pro-life Christian home, but she got drawn into that propaganda that Planned Parenthood is is so masterful at spreading, which is women's rights, women's empowerment. You know, abortion is a very small percentage, but they're really about health care. So she got drawn into that. She steps into the clinic um, as an intern, quickly rises up the ranks. Mm -hmm. I play the head of Planned Parenthood, her boss, and I groom her. I take her under my wing and, and groom her in the story and in the true story. Um, she winds up becoming the youngest clinic director in the history of Planned Parenthood in her early 20s. During the eight years that she's a clinic director, she oversees approximately 22,000 abortions. Wow. But she's always been outside the room. Mm -hmm. She's always been more administrative until one day they need help in a procedure room. So she goes in, she does an ultrasound guided abortion, which means they have the ultrasound wand. She sees the perfectly formed baby. Mm -hmm. So right away she realizes, oh, this isn't a clump of cells. She sees a perfectly formed 13 week baby. And then she sees the baby actually fight and resist being not to be graphic, but being pulled out of the womb. And then she just has an eye-opening revelation from God that what she's been doing is wrong. Um, all the Planned Parenthood propaganda is a lie. And she has a major switch and becomes a, a just a, a radical pro-life leader, which is what she's doing today. And she has a ministry helping abortion workers get out of the industry. So it's a very powerful movie. Um, it's not shaming. It's not condemning. It's emotional. It's redemptive. And I think it's been, um, I know it's been just shocking for people to see the truth about abortion actually with their own eyes. You know, we have an understanding maybe of what it is, but when you see it up on screen, yeah. it changes everything. Yeah. 
What did it did it deepen your your pro life? Were you pro strongly pro life before? And when did you when did you take ownership of your own pro life attitude? I wouldn't say I'm a strong pro lifer. I'm a strong believer, so I believe those two things go hand in hand. But when I was offered the film, I obviously started to do in depth research. And that's when my stand was strengthened because, uh, you know, as a minister, I'm a lover of truth and, mm -hmm. and I love sharing the truth with people because as we know, it's the truth that makes people free. Uh, and it's the same thing with Planned Parenthood. As I stated earlier, they've been masterful in sharing an agenda about who they are that is just not the full truth. And it doesn't take much digging to really uncover who they are. And uh, so it's those kind of things that I learned, that they're really not about planning your parenthood. Uh, they don't show women their ultrasound because they don't want women to bond with their ultrasound uh, with the baby when they mm -hmm. see the baby. Uh, you know, the whole, the whole movement is about pro-choice, but Planned Parenthood really doesn't offer any choices. They really steer you toward one choice. They really are a, a billion dollar corporation. And they got their start in eugenics. Yeah. They got their start with Margaret Sanger, who was an absolute racist, who wanted to eliminate um, the African-American race. So it's, it's facts like this that the general public, even believers, are not aware of. Mm -hmm. So to be able to, to show another side of this abortion industry for people to see, um, it's eye-opening. Yeah. There, there's a line in the film where, I don't know whether you say it, somebody says it, that she just managed to, to become the enemy of one of the strongest corporations in the world. That is my line. That's your I, line. And, and she leaves, I say, you know, congratulations, you've managed to make an enemy of one of the most powerful corporations on the planet. And that is true. She did. And this, she, mov this movie's making, I mean, you've be this movie has become an enemy of Planned Parenthood. What kind of a kickback are, are you seeing? Well, they just blocked all of us from their social media. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, they're obviously not super happy about it, but there's not much they can do. They already sued and lost. You know, they already sued Abby for defamation and, and she won in court in under an hour because wow. because the facts are, you know, she, she has the facts. She was there. She was on the inside. She knows who they really are and what they do. So, you know, we've been blocked at every turn. We were blocked with an R rating. Sure. Um, you know, they try to hit us with an R rating. And as you know, uh, if an R rating is four criteria, um, sexuality, nudity, foul language, and violence. And Unplanned had no sexuality, no nudity, no foul language. But the Motion Picture Association deemed abortion a violent act violent when they act. saw the movie. They actually, you know, they actually kind of kicked themselves in the butt a little bit with that. Sure. <laughs> but, um, but this is a, a film that, uh, you know, usually with rated R, we say, oh, it's restricted. We don't, we want to protect our kids. Mm -hmm. We want to protect ourselves from that kind of imagery. But not with this film. This is a um, this is a film that, for the R rating, our unteamed planned, uh, our unplanned team. I'm sorry, say that R stands for recommended, stands for relevant, stands for real. So it's it's an important film for people to see. Yeah, it's amazing that teenagers can't go see the movie, but they can go get an abortion without their parents' consent. And many places across the country, yeah. a 13, 15, 15 year old girl does not need parental consent to get an abortion, yeah. but she can't see this movie. Yeah. What, what kind of results has, has Abby seen in this? I mean, as far as her ministry is concerned. It's been a mass exodus of abortion workers leaving the industry. It's been powerful, the stories. Uh, we've even had uh, many pro-choicers go into the movie skeptical, but um, it, it's, it's stirred them to do a little bit more research and to understand a little bit more what it is that they actually believe. Um, and of course, there's just been many, many uh, young women and women of all ages that have decided to keep their baby, yeah. that were planning to go have an abortion. You know, I speak at churches all over the country, and, and there have been numerous times where after I've spoken, uh, you know, a gal who was pregnant would come up to me and say, you know, my boyfriend just left me. I was really planning to go get an abortion, but now I've heard you speak. I've seen clips of the movie. I'm, I'm seeing the movie, and I've had a change of heart. So what, what's next for you? I mean, you're back into ministry. You're back into speaking and, and maybe taking the summer off to write a book, but was this a one-off, or is there a chance that you we may see you back up on the screen again? It was pretty fun, actually, to be back in there mm -hmm. and doing uh, using those gifts that had been a bit dormant. Yeah. So I, I believe that there might be a few more roles. I, you know, the, the 
core of what I do is the kingdom work and God's work, but uh, media is so powerful. It's it's so impactful. So I could see this being an arm or a branch yeah. of, um, of continuing to spread the message for God, but it would have to be the right project. Yeah, and we, and we do believe that, that Christians really can begin to make really powerful films and quality films, and, and that's something that's been missing from the media for quite a while. It's happening now. Yeah. I think there's been a whole wave of Christian films, uh, including Unplanned, that the, it's it's beautifully shot. The writing is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's not you know schlocky, Christiany. It's it's impactful. It, you know, acting was fantastic. If I do say so myself. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, was. Uh, it was just it was a. I thought it was an extraordinary film. This is where on other programs you'd be watching a commercial, but not on Viewpoint. If you've never supported TV44 before and enjoy Bob's interviews on Viewpoint, we encourage you to please support us today. Go to WTLW.com and click Donate. The Christians give Christ a bad name. You may be surprised to find out one man says yes, and he's a pastor. Brian Smith is not your typical pastor, though. He came from a strict religious background, then got involved in the bar scene playing in heavy metal bands. But after he surrendered his life to Christ, he's chosen to go after men and women who feel like God has left them behind. You're, you're, the, you're the, the also the author of Christians that give Jesus a bad name. How do we how do we approach our teenagers and approach those people that we love? Maybe they're not a teenager. Maybe it's a sister or brother. Right. How do we approach them without giving Jesus a bad name? I mean, we're panicked almost. Absolutely. They're going to go over the edge. I got to grab them and pull them back. Well, the very first sermon that God put on my heart was called "You Don't Clean Up Before You Take a Shower." And that's the one thing that has been used time and time again. Matter of fact, two people just got saved this last Sunday for the first time ever in their lives. And in less than a year, we've had 85 first time salvations on our pizza bus ministry down in the projects. And basically, wow. it's, and yeah, this yeah. is beautiful. Um, a lot of people think that they have to clean themselves up before they get saved or before they start coming to mm -hmm. church. I've heard it so yep. many times. And finally, God, uh, one time somebody told me, yeah, I believe in Jesus. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I, we're good. And I'm like, God told me to take it further. And I go, so wait a minute. You've confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Well, no, I've never done that. I was like, wait a minute. You're the easiest fish to catch. Why haven't you been saved if you believe everything you need? Well, I know I do this wrong. I know what the uh, Bible says about this. Sin has I, kept me away from God. I, exactly. And I said, you know what? You don't clean up before you take a shower. You don't mow grass for three hours out in a beautiful 90 degree hot, humid Ohio day and then stop at the sink to wash your hands and, and pamper up before you jump in the shower, do you? And they go, no. I was like, you just jump in the shower. I was like, God wants you exactly the way you are at this very moment. Come as you are. And if you actively seek God, He's going to actively seek you. The Holy Spirit's going to enter your heart, and He's going to clean you up along the way. So I don't care what drugs you're doing. I don't care who you're sleeping with. I don't care what's going on. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed your next breath. Mm -hmm. Give your heart to Jesus and let Him start cleaning you up along the way. Okay. And that's worked. I mean, I'm not saying it's the, my power. I'm saying that's what God put on my heart to tell people. He, no matter what yeah. sin is in your life, get saved. Because right now they don't have the Holy Spirit in their mm -hmm. heart. And that's the lie. it's a lie from the pit of hell that you have to clean yourself up first. I don't care what yeah. you're doing. It's amazing how many people believe that lie that somehow I've got to be clean to go to church. I've, right. got, I've got to change myself before I allow God to change me. Well, I hate to break this to people, but Christians are some of the nastiest people I've mm -hmm. ever met when it comes to gossip and it comes to judgment and it comes to all these things. Church is not, you know, you've heard the old cliche, church is not a, a place of perfect people. It's a hospital for the sick. Mm -hmm. And why some of these self-righteous Christians yeah. think they're better than everybody else. Um, I would rather deal with a brother or sister that truly loves Jesus mm -hmm. and is trying with all of their heart that might slip off the wagon every now and then yeah. than to have this goody two shoe self-righteous gossip that sits in the corner talking about her dress is too short. Hey, did you hear what Billy did on Friday night? And they're thinking they're all high and mighty. And that's not Jesus, you know? So mm -hmm. God wants the sinner. He hung out with the sinners and he wants to heal them, but it takes time. So if, if Satan can keep us away from, away from Christ by telling, telling us we're too dirty to come to him, what if there really is something I'm thinking, ah, I don't want to give that up. I don't want to, because if I go to church, they're going to make me want to give that up. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're telling me that 
until they get saved, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, they don't realize the mm -hmm. cleansing power of Christ. No, and that's exactly right. I've heard people say, well, you know, I like doing this too much and I'm just not ready to quit mm -hmm. it. Well, they don't have the Holy Spirit in their heart. So I tell them, and it's the truth. If you think about it, it's, I tell people, you don't have to give up anything right now, nothing. I'm not asking you to give up a thing. All I'm asking you to do is Romans 10, 9. Confess with your mm -hmm. mouth out loud that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you truly believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then church don't get you to heaven, but you wouldn't know math if you didn't go to school. Yeah. So come to church, read God's word and pray. And if you don't know how to pray, start off by just praising him and thanking him for saving you. But in time, you're going to actively seek God. And all of a sudden you're going to wake up six months from now and be like, well, I don't really want to do that anymore. Wow, you know, yeah. like that. You can't There's quit these things. Deliverance, but absolutely, yes. you'll be delivered. But it's something that's so embedded in you for years, if you're living out in the world, it's going to take a while for the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit to wash those things out. And you, and these people, sometimes, you know, some people do a miraculous 180 in a few weeks. Yeah. Praise God. And some, most people, mm -hmm. don't. Yeah. And it's an ongoing, lifelong of seeking God. And then God will eventually convict your heart on certain things. And then you have a choice to make. And that is repent, turn around, walk from it, and then keep seeking God. As for those parents that are panicked right now over where their kids are gone, what, what do you tell them? Where do they need to start? Well, first and foremost, prayer all the time. But first of all, are they living by example? You know, mm -hmm. I see Christians sitting in the pews all the time and they're, they're exposing, they're, they're allowing their kids to be exposed to things, even at home from the sure. type of video games that they play. I'm not saying I love shoot 'em up games, but when everyone's dropping an F-bomb every other mm -hmm. minute and all that, and it, it desensitizes. But what can you do is don't shove Jesus down their throats. Mm -hmm. Don't scare them or, you know, kids are going to be kids, but you have to lead by example and show them, I love you. And, you know, like I said earlier, um, we, if they will just accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, God will love, love that person mm -hmm. to health. So as far as being a parent goes, you can't force, you can't force feed anything mm -hmm. down anybody's throats, let alone your kids. And they're going to hold you, judge you harsher because you're their parents, their parents, you know. So you have to love them and try to put people in their lives, good role models, yeah. whether it's a, a teen leader, a youth leader, somebody that they can look up to. Because I think the parents want to be the superstar in that mm -hmm. relationship. And let's face it, when a kid becomes a teenager, you're the yeah, enemy. Be, yeah. Yep. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Lacey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. Viewpoint is here to bring you insight on topics that often don't get discussed in church or in Bible studies. We feel this is important because the church is being destroyed by a lack of knowledge. If you like Viewpoint, we hope you support it financially. I'm Bob Placey. Thank you for joining me. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast. <laughs>